Critical Metals PLC has recently returned to the London market, so readmission to the main market here in London. Uh, if you've not heard about the company, let me just quickly introduce it. It was formed to identify what it calls of mining opportunities. Uh, uh, the company believes that has been overlooked in the market, and it has uh, an asset, the Malulu uh, Copper Cobalt Project in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Russell Fryer is uh, founder and chief executive. He joins us now. Welcome to London, because I know you've uh, you've trekked around London this morning, meeting all sorts of people, uh, and you're here to um, to uh, talk about the business which has come back to the market. Explain more about what's happened, because this readmission is an interesting term. Sure. Well, first of all, thank you for having me, Jeremy. So I came across this asset in 2018, and it was really three properties that the owners never spoke to each other. So I'd put personally some money in to amalgamate the properties to make it institutionalized and investable. And so what happened is, is we were prepared to go into production on a private basis in 2019, and then COVID hit. But subsequently in 2019, I had actually started and founded Critical Metals PLC, and I had to go to the board and say, look, we have this asset uh, in our books. Um, I think it's a great asset. I need to be a uh, fiduciary and show it to the board. So I gave them all the technical reports and the financials, and they said, this is a real winner, we believe. Um, let's actually put it inside of Critical Metals as a first transaction. So we listed on the 28th of September, 2020, right in the middle of COVID. We uh, had a market cap of 1.8 million pounds, raised about 800,000 pounds. And um, during COVID, we kept this on care and maintenance. And um, we went to the owners and said, look, let's do a transaction. Um, this is the local partners. They keep 30%. Uh, the holding company in Mauritius owns 70% on an indirect uh, see-through basis. And Critical Metals PLC bought 57% or controlling interest of that Mauritian asset. So right now we have the geologists and the mine engineers on the ground. We've actually uh, spoken to the uh, competent person who's going to write the JORC report. We expect the JORC report to be out uh, towards the end of this year. That'll be massively value accretive to shareholders. Um, in this JORC report, we hope to have um, some intercepts and some drill results from the cobalt side, uh, along with the copper side. Yeah. Let me just quickly go back to the share structure, if I can. You said you put money into the uh, to begin with to get the thing going. Yes. Are you a, a fairly substantial shareholder? Yes. So after this uh, capital raise of, of 1.8 million pounds plus a 200,000 pound warrant exercise, uh, I own 22, just over 22% of the company, and I've bought every one of my shares. We don't give out free shares or options. Right. So I've participated on all four of the capital raisings. Yeah, I think it's important to establish that because when we're talking to potential investors, they want to know that you have what they call skin in the game. Yes. Anyway. Uh, look, um, let's let's talk a little bit more about why copper cobalt. You say you got this asset, you took it to some people that were interested in it, and they said it's a great asset. Why? What is it about this that strikes the right sort of balance in why it's a good asset? Well, before we amalgamated the properties, this asset was producing. And in fact, uh, one of the biggest open pits that we have, it's underwater right now, we have a picture of eight 25-ton trucks uh, 50 meters below in the pit, taking out the sulfide ore. And the sulfide ore is high grade, 10% plus type ores. And so what happened was, is um, when COVID came, uh, the pits filled with water, so people couldn't steal the ore while we weren't watching because there was no one obviously on, on the property. Yeah. There's one pit that we're going to be visiting uh, next week that's not underwater, and I suggest that we'll probably put that one in production here in the next 60 to 90 days. Yeah. Why did the original owners want to sell if it was such a good asset? Because there were three different owners that didn't speak to each other, yeah. and it's a, it's a typical case okay. of one plus one plus one equals ten. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so um, they didn't have the capital. They weren't talking to each other. They didn't have the technical expertise. So we came in and said, look, we'll come in, we'll put the capital in, we'll restart the mines and um, we'll declare dividends uh, on a local level for them to start getting cash flow locally. OK, um, you've spoken a little bit about the amount of money you've got in the balance sheet. What are you going to do with that? How long is it going to take you into the path towards ultimate production, obviously, as the goal, presumably? Well, sure. So our market cap is seven million. We've got about three sterling, million pounds is, sterling. Yes, yeah. seven million sterling. Um, on the latest uh, financial statements, we had a million net cash and we had 24,000 in debt. And we have just raised, you know, gross on a gross basis, two million pounds. So we're very cash flush. The transaction to get the mine restarted is $750,000, all right? And what's interesting is, is the uh, weakness of the sterling, because we're gonna, we're gonna sell in dollars, we've got a 15% kicker on the earnings yeah. on the upside, yeah, yeah, yeah. all right? Now, obviously, uh, UK-based people don't like to see that the sterling is weak, but certainly with us selling in US dollars in December, 
um, that translation back into the balance sheet on an EPS basis is is fifteen percent minimum. Yeah, uh, let's let's talk a little bit about what you got to do before you get to the stage of production and so forth. What is it you're doing now? What's in your in tray? What's to come sure. on on the in the pipeline? So we've ordered a uh, twenty uh, person uh, camp of tents, tents yeah, from right. South Africa. We are going to rehabilitate the road. The road's thirty eight kilometers of uh, dirt road. About two thirds of it needs rehabilitation because of uh, water degradation. You know, the roads just, and during the rainy season, nobody's kept it up. And, uh, you know, during COVID, absolutely nobody kept it up. We ordered uh, XRF, which is a handheld, just to make sure that the ore that we're mining is, is the ore that we want. It's payable ore. Um, we've got our uh, mine engineers and geologists. We, uh, we've just hired a project engineer and the mine engineer and the mine manager will come in uh, in about a month or so. So we've got a full complement of people. Like I said before, we've hired the competent person to write the JORC report. That will be coming up. So we, we're, we're going. And in fact, the board of directors of Critical Metals and myself are heading to the Congo this weekend to uh, visit the mine and to uh, look at, at the progress that's going on the ground. So are these mines, two are underwater. You're going to keep those underwater for the time being until you start producing on the first one? Yes, yeah, so we have uh, four pits. Three right, of them okay. are underwater. Okay. Um, and those are really the high-grade sulfide ores. And then we've got an oxide pit that's open that's anywhere between 2 and 8% oxide ore. And it's, it's very, very rich. If you look at what's the comparative compared to, say, Peru or Chile or even Arizona, um, those grades are not 0.5, not 0.4s, and we're at 2% plus in terms of our oxide quality. So we will um, put that first pit into uh, production, uh, like I said, in the next 60, 90 days, and uh, we'll have first cash flow by the end of the year. Yeah, so then that what then pays for the pumping out of the other mines? Yeah. You're gonna do the same sort of thing in those mines? So the rain season starts in about November and goes to March. So we would just say, okay, let's wait till the rain season's over. Let's pump out the water from the three pits. Let's delineate what, where we want to go in terms of mining, and then we'll start on the sulfides. And the sulfides is really high grade and massively cash flow accretive to the to the business. So I personally want to attack the the sulfide seams, um, but we'll wait till after the rain season. Yeah. Do, do these mines naturally fill, or had you filled them because of this idea about the fact you want to protect them from theft, or do they naturally fill? I think the question I'm trying to get to here is whether or not there's an ongoing cost to continue pumping. Yes. So during the rain season, there is. We're going to buy our own uh, water uh, pump. Sump pump is what it's called. Mm -hmm. So we'll buy our own sump pump here in uh, March or so. We don't need to, to have that expenditure now. But if you get a big enough pump, you can pump quicker than the rains. It can fill your, yeah, fill your yeah, tent. Yeah. And it's common, you know, throughout the world in the open pits in, yeah, say, the equator side of, of the world. Um, you, you know, you can pump out and have open pits um, mm. quite regularly. How do you run those? So they diesel, and they certainly were in the old days. And nowadays, people are going more and more towards renewables if they can. Is there an opportunity to make it a green mining operation? Sure. It's funny you mention that. So we have a, a, a stream stroke small river on our property. And one of the things that I'm looking at is uh, hydro uh, power generation. Uh -huh. And so I'm actually going with um, one of the mine engineers to the stream. And as long as it, it uh, flows at least uh, 1,000 cubic meters per minute, we'll be able to put a turbine in and generate power on a green basis. And there's a village next door, and ideally if we have more uh, power than we can utilize at the mine, then I'd like to electrify the village next door, part of our green our ESG program. One of the other uh, ESG program, you know, we're looking to put in some solar panels and a wind turbine. So, you know, six months of the year, uh, the wind doesn't blow, but the sun shines. And then the, during the rain season, obviously there's no sun, but there is uh, wind, so I'll have that. Plus, then if I have some water or hydro uh, power generations, we'll be able to tick a lot of boxes, save a lot of fuel. You know, our margins will start to expand, and we'll do some good for the village. Mm. It's obviously good to hear this. It's a nice, nice social story as well. Um, but looking further afield, the DRC is has a little bit of a, a, a political reputation. Um, how far away are you from? I mean, are you isolated? Are you fairly uniquely placed and what's what's the relationship with the government like and the environment in which you're mining? So the, the government relationship's actually been proven. They're very much pro-West. And right. in fact, Anthony Blinken, the Secretary of State in the US, was there in uh, the Congo about August the 7th or so. Mm -hmm. So um, the World Bank and the IMF are all looking at uh, projects there. Inga 2, Inga 3 are all being refurbished, uh, create some more power. And the recipe for success are companies like Ivanhoe, companies like Barrick, 
um, that have sat there and said, we're going to come in, we're going to be good corporate citizens, we're going to provide jobs for locals, we're going to hand over uh, the transfer, um, and we're going to pay dividends to the government. And, you know, we want to follow their footsteps and being a, a, a good neighbor in their neighborhood. Mm. Okay, let's just take a look now at um, where you hope to see the company in three, six, 10, 12 months time or so forth. When you come back in here in six months, what are you going to be talking about? I'll be hopefully talking about a second, third transaction. Right. Um, you know, obviously it's in talk, uh, coffee talk stages, but I'm on the record saying that we want to have uh, five uh, polymetallic mines in five different jurisdictions, spread the risk. And so what we want is a stable EBITDA in the secondary and tertiary metals. You know? yeah. So those metals are, are the metals that say Anglo or Rio Tinto are not interested in. Yes, they are interested in copper. Yeah. To a lesser extent, Glencore is interested in cobalt. But if you think about tantalum or niobium or, or even um, uranium, they're not interested in those type of minerals. So we're going to go not? after those. What is it about that that's causing these companies to, to shy away from this? I mean, we're talking about tech metals, aren't we? The metals yes. that go into batteries and new technologies. Why are they not focusing in on that? Why are they leaving it up to you, which obviously is an opportunity for critical metals? What's going on in the sector? So they have such a big balance sheet, they have to allocate. So if you right. think about, they need to control and they like to see 20, 30 years life of mine. And so if they don't have that, everything else falls by the wayside. Um, we actually think that with some drilling, we'll have a 20 years life on our property. So we could attract some of the, the majors here, assuming we're successful in our on our investigation and our drilling programs. But, um, you know, with the big people, they, you know, if you think about what a, a container of tantalum costs, you know, it's 50,000 a ton. And, you know, if you do 10 tons, that's, you know, 500,000, but that's not a big enough to move the dial for an Anglo or a Rio. Whereas if we can actually take that 10 tons and increase it by five times, you know, for a small company like ours, the margins are massive. Yeah. And um, that's a good to the bottom line. I mean, our goal in two years is to get to 20 million of EBITDA, 20 million sterling EBITDA. So, you know, that's our goal for two years. So hopefully in six months, we're well on our way to that. Well, we look forward to speaking to you again so we can get an update from you. That's in the meantime, Russell, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you for having me. It's Russell Fryer. He's the chief executive of the company that's just recently been readmitted to the London market, Critical Metals.